Lesson 6 For what nation is there so great? Sabbath afternoon October 30 If they would keep his commandments, God promised to give them the finest of the wheat and bring them honey out of the rock. With long life would he satisfy them and show them his salvation. Through disobedience to God, Adam and Eve had lost Eden, and because of sin, the whole earth was cursed. But if God's people followed his instruction, their land would be restored to fertility and beauty. God himself gave them directions in regard to the culture of the soil, and they were to cooperate with him in its restoration. Thus the whole land, under God's control, would become an object lesson of spiritual truth. As in obedience to his natural laws, the earth should produce its treasures, so in obedience to his moral law, the hearts of the people were to reflect the attributes of his character. Even the heathen would recognize the superiority of those who served and worshipped the living God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 289 Where shall we find laws more noble, pure, and just than are exhibited on the statute books wherein is recorded the instruction given to Moses for the children of Israel? From what other source can we gather such strength or learn such noble science? What other book will teach men so well how to love, fear, and obey God? What other book presents to students more ennobling science, more wonderful history? It clearly portrays righteousness and foretells the consequence of disloyalty to the law of Jehovah. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 428. The Lord has given great light and privileges to his people. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, he says. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. As a people, we are to stand under the banner of Jesus Christ. We are to consecrate ourselves to God as a distinct, separate, and peculiar people. He speaks to us, saying, Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 478. There should be an intelligent knowledge of how to come to God in reverence and godly fear with devotional love. There is a growing lack of reverence for our Maker, a growing disregard of His greatness and His majesty. But God is speaking to us in these last days. In these perilous times, those who profess to be God's commandment-keeping people should guard against the tendency to lose the spirit of reverence and godly fear. The scriptures teach men how to approach their Maker with humility and awe through faith in a divine mediator. Let man come on bended knee as a subject of grace, a suppliant at the footstool of mercy. Thus he is to testify that the whole soul, body, and spirit are in subjection to his Creator. God's Amazing Grace, page 91. Sunday, October 31. Do not add or take away. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God are the words of our Savior. Errors in doctrine are multiplying and twining themselves with serpent-like subtlety around the affections of the people. There is not a doctrine of the Bible that has not been denied. The great truths of prophecy showing our position in the history of the world have been shorn of their beauty and power by the clergy, who seek to make these all-important truths dark and incomprehensible. In many cases, the children are drifting away from the old landmarks. Those who have seen the truth and felt its importance and have had an experience in the things of God are to teach sound doctrine to their children. They should make them acquainted with the great pillars of our faith, the reasons why we are Seventh-day Adventists, why we are called 
as were the children of Israel, to be a peculiar people, a holy nation, separate and distinct from all other people on the face of the earth. These things should be explained to the children in simple language, easy to be understood. And as they grow in years, the lessons imparted should be suited to their increasing capacity until the foundations of truth have been laid broad and deep. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 330. The religious life of the Jewish nation had become a pretense. When the law was proclaimed on Mount Sinai by the voice of God, all the people pledged themselves to obey. They said, I go, sir, but they went not. When Christ came in person to set before them the principles of the law, they rejected him. Christ had given the Jewish leaders of his day abundant evidence of his authority and divine power, but although they were convinced, they would not accept the evidence. Christ had shown them that they continued to disbelieve because they had not the spirit which leads to obedience. He had declared to them, Ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew chapter 15, verses 6 and 9. Christ's Object Lessons, page 276. Christ was loyal to God's commandments, setting aside the human traditions and requirements which had been exalted in their place. Because of this, he was hated and persecuted. This history is repeated. The laws and traditions of men are exalted above the law of God, and those who are true to God's commandments suffer reproach and persecution. Christ, because of his faithfulness to God, was accused as a Sabbath breaker and blasphemer. He was declared to be possessed of a devil and was denounced as Beelzebub. In like manner, his followers are accused and misrepresented. Thus Satan hopes to lead them to sin and cast dishonor upon God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 170. Monday, November 1. Baal Peor Near the close of the wilderness wandering, the conditions of the covenant had been repeated. At Baal Peor, on the very borders of the promised land, where many fell a prey to subtle temptation, those who remained faithful renewed their vows of allegiance. Through Moses they were warned against the temptations that would assail them in the future and they were earnestly exhorted to remain separate from the surrounding nations and to worship God alone. Moses traced the evils that would result from a departure from the statutes of Jehovah. Calling heaven and earth to witness, he declared that if, after having dwelt long in the land of promise, the people should introduce corrupt forms of worship and bow down to graven images and should refuse to return to the worship of the true God, the anger of the Lord would be aroused and they would be carried away captive and scattered among the heathen. Prophets and Kings, pages 293 to 295. Satan at once laid a snare whereby Israel should be enchanted with the beautiful Moabitish women, who would lead them to transgress God's law. Thus iniquity would be found in them, and God's blessing would not rest upon them. Their forces would be greatly weakened, and their enemies would no longer fear their power, because the presence of the Lord of hosts was not with their armies. This is intended as a warning to the people of God living in the last days. If they follow after righteousness and true holiness, if they keep all the commandments of God, Satan and his agents will not be permitted to overcome them. All the opposition of their bitterest foes will prove powerless to destroy or uproot the vine of God's own planting. Satan understands what Israel learned by sad experience, that there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither divination against Israel, while iniquity is not cherished among them. Therefore his power and influence will ever be employed to mar their unity and defile the purity of their characters. His snares are laid in a thousand ways to weaken their power for good. 
Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 598 and 599. It is a perilous thing to allow an unchristian trait to live in the heart. One cherished sin will, little by little, debase the character, bringing all its nobler powers into subjection to the evil desire. The removal of one safeguard from the conscience, the indulgence of one evil habit, one neglect of the high claims of duty, breaks down the defenses of the soul and opens the way for Satan to come in and lead us astray. The only safe course is to let our prayers go forth daily from a sincere heart, as did David. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. Psalm 17, verse 5. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 452. Tuesday, November 2. Cleave to the Lord your God. Ancient Israel were especially directed by God to be and remain a people separate from all nations. They were not to be subjected to witnessing the idolatry of those about them, lest their own hearts should be corrupted, lest familiarity with ungodly practices should make them appear less wicked in their eyes. Few realize their own weakness and that the natural sinfulness of the human heart too often paralyzes their noblest endeavors. The baleful influence of sin poisons the life of the soul. Our only safety is in separation from those who live in its darkness. The Lord has enjoined upon us to come out from among them and be separate and to touch not the unclean thing, and he will receive us and will be a father unto us, and we shall be his sons and daughters. If we wish to be adopted into the family of God, to become children of the heavenly King, we must comply with His conditions. We must come out from the world and stand as a peculiar people before the Lord, obeying His precepts and serving Him. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 109. The true followers of Christ will have sacrifices to make. They will shun places of worldly amusement because they find no Jesus there, no influence which will make them heavenly-minded and increase their growth in grace. Obedience to the Word of God will lead them to come out from all these things and be separate. By their fruits ye shall know them, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. The Savior declared, all the true followers of Christ bear fruit to His glory. Their lives testify that a good work has been wrought in them by the Spirit of God, and their fruit is unto holiness. Their lives are elevated and pure. Right actions are the unmistakable fruit of true godliness, and those who bear no fruit of this kind reveal that they have no experience in the things of God. They are not in the vine. Said Jesus, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, pages 328. And 329. While we should realize our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own. We are to exert every energy of the soul in the work of overcoming and to look to Jesus for strength to do what we cannot do for ourselves. No sin can be tolerated in those who shall walk with Christ in white. Their attention is fixed upon Him. Their hopes, their faith are centered on Him. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 472. Wednesday, November 3. 
For what nation is there so great? The purpose which God seeks to accomplish through His people today is the same that He desired to accomplish through Israel when He brought them forth out of Egypt. By beholding the goodness, the mercy, the justice, and the love of God revealed in the church, the world is to have a representation of His character. And when the law of God is thus exemplified in the life, even the world will recognize the superiority of those who love and fear and serve God above every other people on the earth. The Lord has his eye upon every one of his people. He has his plans concerning each. It is his purpose that those who practice his holy precepts shall be a distinguished people. For what nation is there so great? who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 8. Even these words fail of expressing the greatness and the glory of God's purpose to be accomplished through his people. Not to this world only, but to the universe are we to make manifest the principles of his kingdom. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 12 and 13. Our duty will only be discerned and appreciated when viewed in the light which shines from the life of Christ. As the sun rises in the east and passes toward the west, filling the world with light, so the true follower of Christ will be a light unto the world. He will go forth into the world as a bright and shining light, that those who are in darkness may be lighted and warmed by the rays shining forth from him. Christ says of his followers, Ye are the light of the world. When the grace of Christ is expressed in the words and works of the believers, light will shine forth to those who are in darkness. For while the lips are speaking to the praise of God, the hand will be stretched out in beneficence for the help of the perishing. Sons and Daughters of God, page 276 We need more sunshiny Christians. We are too much shut up within ourselves, too often the kindly encouraging word, the cheery smile, are withheld from our children and from the oppressed and discouraged. From every Christian home a holy light should shine forth. Love should be revealed in action. It should flow out in all home intercourse, showing itself in thoughtful kindness, in gentle, unselfish courtesy. There are homes where this principle is carried out, homes where God is worshipped and truest love reigns. From these homes, morning and evening prayer ascends to God as sweet incense, and His mercies and blessings descend upon the suppliants like the morning dew. The Adventist Home, page 37 Thursday, November 4 Your Wisdom and Your Understanding those today to whom the Lord has given great light will find their only safety in walking in the way of the Lord, placing themselves where He can carry out His will through them. God will do large things for those who will learn of Him, not taking counsel of themselves, but of Him who never makes a mistake. Our safety, our wisdom, is in recognizing and heeding God's instructions. The most valuable knowledge that we can obtain is the knowledge of God. Those who walk humbly before Him, loving Him supremely and obeying His word, will be blessed with wisdom. They will be given the knowledge of heaven to impart to others. Wisdom is God's gift to be kept pure from all contamination. Its possession lays upon everyone on whom it is bestowed a peculiar obligation to glorify God by blessing His fellow men. He is ever to keep before Him the fear of God inquiring at every step, is this the way of the Lord? Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 1032.
We are to come to God in faith and pour out our supplications before Him, believing that He will work in our behalf and in the behalf of those we are seeking to save. We are to devote more time to earnest prayer. With the trusting faith of a little child, we are to come to our Heavenly Father, telling Him of all our needs. He is always ready to pardon and help. The supply of divine wisdom is inexhaustible, and the Lord encourages us to draw largely from it. The longing that we should have for spiritual blessings is described in the words, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. We need a deeper soul hunger for the rich gifts that heaven has to bestow. We are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 1146. Salt is valued for its preservative properties, and when God calls His children salt, He would teach them that His purpose in making them the subjects of His grace is that they may become agents in saving others. The object of God in choosing a people before all the world was not only that He might adopt them as His sons and daughters, but that through them the world might receive the grace that bringeth salvation. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 The savor of the salt represents the vital power of the Christian, the love of Jesus in the heart, the righteousness of Christ pervading the life. The love of Christ is diffusive and aggressive. If it is dwelling in us, it will flow out to others. We shall come close to them till their hearts are warmed by our unselfish interest and love. The sincere believers diffuse vital energy, which is penetrating and imparts new moral power to the souls for whom they labor. It is not the power of the man himself, but the power of the Holy Spirit that does the transforming work. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 35 and 36. For further reading, Spiritual Gifts, The Law of God, Volume 3, pages 261 to 304, and Reflecting Christ, Wait, Watch, and Pray, page 119.